Welcome back. This is Nicole Naditz, your host for this series of interviews that bring to life the high leverage teaching practices for world language educators. I want to again thank the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii for their stewardship on this project, which includes not only these interviews, but two webinars and a series of short TED-Ed style courses. And it's hard to believe we are already past the halfway point in our interview series. The fourth high leverage teaching practice is all about focusing on form in meaningful linguistic and cultural texts and contexts using a model called PACE or PACE. This model brings the first three high leverage teaching practices to bear as teachers select texts that will provide multiple opportunities to not only experience language structures in context, but as a springboard to communication using those structures. Our guest for this HLTP has extensive experience in this process. Randa Taftaf is an author, educator, and founding director of Rumana Publishing, a company that strives to bridge cultures of the East and West through the creation of fun, interactive, bilingual textbooks and stories. Equipped with a fiery passion for languages and an MED from the University of Pittsburgh, Randa is a seasoned foreign language instructor of over 20 years. Over the course of her career, she has founded and directed exemplary ESL programs, mentored and trained educators and writers, authored and developed curricula, and more. Some of the organizations she has worked with locally and internationally include Pearson Education, University of South Florida, TESOL, and UNHCR. So we're gonna turn it without any further ado over to Randa. Randa, what is the acronym PACE stand for and how do these four stages differ from how teachers often present language structures to their learners? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, the PACE model is a dialogical approach to teaching grammar, and each letter stands for a stage in the process. So you've got P for presentation, A for attention, C for co-construction, and E for extension. Um, what makes the PACE model unique is that it is a, an approach that allows the teacher and the student to co-construct the grammar together. Now, if we go back a little bit to the history of grammar, the ever-changing history of grammar instruction, we know that there are basically two prevalent styles of teaching grammar. We've got the deductive, deductive approach, we've got the inductive approach, right? So the de deductive approach is really, um, there's a huge burden on the teacher to teach the grammar. Usually the class is teacher fronted. The teacher, I mean, I'm guilty of doing this. I remember back 20 plus years ago when I first started, you know, you put the grammar board on, grammar on the board, you kind of explain it, you give your students exercises, drill, drill, drill. The focus is very on the, on the form. The focus is extremely, um, for, it's form focused. Now, what happens is that when you're form focused, your students don't really know how to use the grammar, you know, functionally. So they don't know how to um, use it in their speech or in their writing. Fast forward, you've got then the inductive approach, which is kind of, um, if you think of children, babies, when they're first born, after a few years, they can speak the, lang the native language with no grammar instruction needed, right? So based on that premise, they said, hey, if we teach our students a lot of content, we give them a lot of comprehensible content, maybe somehow they'll just kind of magically pick up on this grammar. So I'm guilty of that too. I've tried that. I was around when that wave kind of. Um, anyhow, so what happens is that the deductive approach is teacher-centric. Um, form focus, and then you've got the inductive approach, which is that burden is mostly on the student to kind of figure things out on their own. Um, and then you have the PACE model, which says, you know, let's co-construct this grammar together. So the burden is now kind of equal on the learner and the instructor. That's a really helpful introduction to this whole model. And in earlier inter in an er sorry, in an earlier interview for this program, our guests talked a lot about the effective use of authentic texts, but your focus and the focus of this HLTP goes even deeper into cultural texts. So can you share some examples of cultural texts, including for novice learners and why they are so important for students to learn and use grammatical forms? 
cultural texts are just simply a lot more meaningful, richer, and just simply more fun to use, right? Any authentic text is not as fun, like, for example, um, newspaper clipping is an authentic text, right? But the goal of the PACE model is to make the whole experience um, very interactive and meaningful for the students. So a cultural text just naturally contains one of the elements of you know culture right you've got your three p's your practices your perspectives and your products and that allows for more meaningful conversations you know you're bringing the whole world into your classroom and that just allows the students to make more connections with the text and another important reason why we like to use cultural text in the pace model is that remember we're not form focused right we want to show these students how the language is used in culturally, culturally appropriate setting, right? So in a story, for example, the language is used naturally. So we want, we want to show the students that, you know, this is how the, this expression or grammatical function is used in a natural setting. Um, some examples of authentic texts could be um, a short story, a folk tale, um, a fable, a poem, a song, really anything meaningful for the student. Um, my tip for choosing, like the, the choosing of the story is the number one most important thing when you're presenting the PACE model. So your choice will really affect the entire course of the lesson. So try to choose a story that is at the level of the student or you know, a little above is fine. Um, something fun, something meaningful, and something that has repetition. So repetition of the grammar that you're trying to teach. So let's say you're teaching the simple present, you want a song or a poem that has the simple present um, repeatedly in, in, in the actual song or story. I think you just segued beautifully into our next question. Um, we're going to start with the presentation phase, the P in PACE, which is focused on telling cultural stories that will facilitate the later stages of the PACE model. But teachers are advised not to read the story, but to actually tell it. Why is that important? And what are some key strategies that you recommend to promote both comprehension of and interaction with the story. Okay, so the presentation phase, the goal of the presentation phase is for the student to understand the story, or the, when I say story, I'm, I mean cultural text, just from here on, because I kind of fall back on that because I really like to tell stories. So, um, so, so the goal is for the students to understand the meaning. So that's why in the presentation phase, the story is told three different ways and three times in order to make sure that the students understand and fully grasp the meanings in the story. Now, the reason why we tell the story and we don't read it is because we want to be as interactive as possible. And just naturally telling a story gives room for interaction, right? Because we believe, going back to Vygotsky and sociocultural, sociocultural theory, learning is a social process, right? So whenever the teacher is telling the story, it just makes it more dramatic, more interesting, more meaningful, and also allows lots of room for give and take, for interaction, for the students to be more involved in their own learning, rather than them reading the story silently or the teacher reading the story aloud. For better comprehension, one of the strategies that I like to use is to kind of pre-teach the um the vocabulary for example that's in the story and once you set the story up before like you want to do some pre-teaching of the of the concepts of the vocab before you actually start the story so that when you tell the story they're familiar with what you're talking about you don't have to stop as much it'll just kind of flow naturally so that's one of the first things i do and the way i like to do that is i really focus on my questioning strategies so for example let's say i have a story a fable and it contains um, um, I don't know a picture of an ant so I'll, you know open the slide show them the ant. after I've taught it I want to make sure that I you know elicit responses and make sure that they've actually learned it what I do is I start with an open-ended question like what is this and if they can tell me great if not I go down to a forced choice question and I say is this an ant or is it a grasshopper and then um, 
if still they are still struggling, that's when I go back down to the yes, no question. So I do that on and off through all the vocabulary words just to make sure and to check comprehension even before of the vocabulary before I even start the story. So preparing the story is, a, is one of the um, key factors, I think, in the success of the actual presentation stage. Perfect. That goes right along with what we know about literacy development anyway, that mm -hmm. our learners benefit from um, opportunities we provide them to prepare for the content they're about to interact with. Exactly. Um, kind of like a warm up, right? Right. Exactly. Um, and then in the PACE model, the attention phase is probably the shortest. So can you briefly tell us what has to occur during this phase and why is it important to note here? the you know so now that the students ha understand the story right they have all the meanings they've dug deep into it they completely understand the story now that they have full comprehension of the story now it's time to go and focus now on the language on the form right so we were done with meaning now we're going to focus on the form so in order to rivet their attention what you could do is possibly pull out parts of um like sentences that are in the story or in the poem and highlight the grammar structure that you're trying to teach. And what I usually do is I make a, you know, I don't, you don't have to pull out all of the examples in the story. Three or four are usually enough. And I just stick them on a slide and I highlight them so that, you know, that's the first thing they, they see when they look at the slide. The goal of the attention phase is that to kind of make sure that the teacher and the student are on the same page. So now, we're focusing on this form, we're gonna talk about it, we're gonna have a conversation about it, are we all on the same page? Once you know your students are on the same page, then that's kind of like a green light to move on to the next stage. Perfect, which is the co-construction phase. Okay. And so in that phase of PACE, teachers are cautioned to avoid a sort of one-way inquisition of the, st of the students while they're doing it, in which the teacher repeatedly just fires questions at the students about the grammatical form, leaving the students to determine both kind of the meaning and the use on their own. Why is it important to include pair and small group interactions throughout this co-construction phase. And maybe even tell us a little bit about what that co-construction might look like so that they're, you mentioned earlier as them working together with the teacher. So discourse is the most important characteristic in, in a teacher's instruction because the language itself is a mediation tool, right? And it directly relates to the like learning outcomes. So as teachers, we have to be very careful, you know, of our language, of our, of our own, um, discourse. So in the co-construction phase, what we try to do is we try to keep it as natural as possible. So it's just like a simple conversation, right? It's the student and the teacher having a conversation, a dialogue about this grammatical function form, meaning it can be about anything. It's mostly student-led. As the instructor, I'll have some guiding questions, um, you're no longer in the stage, you're not, you're not the sage on the stage, you're more of the guide on the side, is what we like to say. So here you're, you're, you're both, you're kind of guiding the conversation, but you have to keep it as natural as possible. So um, what, what I do usually is like I reiterate, so when the student's using their own language, for example, to express the grammatical form or the function, then I'll go back and I'll repeat that, let's say, at, especially towards the end in more teacher framed words. But that's not till the end until, you know, they've already said and used their own, you know, language to express what they think. And then I can go back finally at the end and kind of repeat what they told me, but just in more formal terms. And so, in this phase, um, the students are coming to an understanding of the grammatical form that you, that you as the teacher had wanted them to um, through that very brief attention phase where you already told them this is what we're going to be talking about, this is what we're honing in on, let's pay attention to this now, and now they've, they've had an opportunity to have a facilitated discussion about that. Exactly. And so now that they're talking, usually in this phase, I like to do it first. I usually co-construct with them first. But then afterwards, I put them in groups and pairs to kind of repeat to each other kind of what they learned. And obviously, the content, the story is really our main focus. You know, that's where we're getting 
you know, we don't want to forget the content. So it's a, it's a prevalent topic in our conversation. When we always go back to the story and say, well, why did the, you know, for example, um, why did the character, you know, say this? So, you know, stuff like that. So. Right. Because that provides the window also into the cultural perspectives that underlie all of the actions and so on. So we have to keep coming back to that culturally authentic text and what it says because of the wealth of information that it provides beyond just the words and the forms. Uh -huh. exactly. um, so what kind of activities do you recommend for the extension phase and why? So for the extension phase, you know, basically the students now understand the meaning, the form, the function, you know, they've got the grammar, but now the extension phase is kind of the step where we're offering them practice. This is the time for them to actually take that grammar and use it. So you want to create activities that are, that are connected to the content that you had given initially and um, just make it meaningful for them. So for example, if we go back to this, the idea of this, the fable and the story of the ant, I might ask them to change the ending of the story, right? And they're gonna use the grammar that they learned and they're gonna retell the story using that grammar, um, but they'll change the ending to make it the way that they want to, for example. So the extension can really be any, anything just as long as it's connected to the grammar and connected to the content, it can be anything. It's just an opportunity for them to practice what they've learned. Thank you. Um, one of the risks that teachers face when they first try to implement PACE is to instead do discovery learnings, learning. So can you share with us what some of the pitfalls of discovery learning are in this context and then how to avoid it the first time you try to implement the PACE model? Exactly. Discovery learning, I mean, in theory, would be amazing, right? <laughs> Putting the students in groups and having them kind of figure out the grammar on their own. But what ends up happening, you know, this is something, these are things that linguists have struggled for years to kind of figure out. So we're putting them in, in groups and, and, you know, expecting them to figure it out on their own. Discovery learning is not really effective. It causes a lot of frustration. Students get upset because you're kind of setting them up for failure in a way right? You're not giving them a, um, enough tools to, to figure it out because they can't figure it out on their own. They need more help and scaffolding from the instructor. Um, for that reason, one of, this could possibly happen in the co-construction phase, right? So after the story was told by the instructor and they've repeated it three times, then the attention and you're back into the construction phase. In the co-construction phase, that's why I like to always kind of have that initial conversation with my students directly first. So we talk about the grammar, teacher, student first, before I put them in groups. Because if I immediately put them in groups without having that dialogue as the instructor, then that's when discovery learning might happen and they might get frustrated because they can't really figure it out completely on their own. Uh, what about U-shaped learning? What is that and what are its implications for teachers as they design learning experiences knowing that U-shaped learning is going to happen? Language, learner, language learning is a developmental process, right? It takes time. So knowing that, teachers just need to be kind of um, aware that their students are not going to magically learn something immediately and just keep it you know, it's not, it's not going to be consistent. It's a, it's a process. So what ends up happening is that, for example, let's say I teach something the first day and my students or a student, for example, knows how to use the grammar perfectly fine. And then the next class or a few classes later, I, I go back and that student is struggling with that same form again. And um, usually, it, you know, for me as the instructor, instructor, it seems like the student has regressed but they haven't, it's actually just part of the process, right? So what ends up happening is that that information takes time in order for the brain to process, to store it into their um, long-term memory. So usually after that little regression, usually a few classes later, they're able to use that again. So it's just part of the process. They kind of go one step, they go one step forward, then one step back, and then they go back forward again but if a teacher realizes that that's part of the process then you know it it's a lot less stressful 
And um, knowing that you also need to plan, especially for assessments and stuff, kind of plan around that. So you need to make sure that you're giving your students enough time for them to go through that whole you before you can actually really assess to see if they've learned the concept or not. Yeah, thank you. I, my uh, friend and I who do a lot of professional, uh, we facilitate a lot of professional learning together. And when we talk to teachers, we call it the messy phase. Yeah, exactly. That phase where you, you know, but we covered this last week, you know, and then they're wondering why, or even a month ago, and they're like, but you, you knew it. Why don't you know it now? Well, because that's the way the brain takes in the information. They, they aren't going to automatically take it in, get it correct, do it immediately and then still do it a month later when you've added new things on top of it exactly exactly That's part of the process and you're right it really does make teachers realize that they can give themselves and their learners permission and they have to give their learners permission to go through that whole you they're not going to just progress like this or even in a, a line going up exactly exactly um you and others who work really deeply with this model emphasize the importance of not only context but also how the grammatical forms of each language construct and convey both social and cultural meanings like there's more to the form than just the words and the order in which the words occur in the sentence all of that structural information comes packed with social and cultural meaning so can you give us a couple of examples of grammatical forms that are often taught as rules or patterns but that would be better acquired if the focus shifted instead to the socio-cultural role that that form plays. Exactly, like um, I can, I know after so many years of teaching ESL, um, one of the hardest grammatical concepts to teach is the present perfect, right? It's just um, so tricky because it's used in so many different um, situations that it's hard for the students to kind of comprehend and know exactly when to use it. And that's why, something like this, like the PACE model, would really help in teaching something like the present perfect. So if you just focus on the form of the present perfect, they're usually okay with it. But then when you come and you want them to use it, it takes a lot, a lot, some a long time even. Um, more advanced learners are the ones that can actually use the present perfect, even though they're taught the present perfect probably early on. So that's one of the examples that I know that using a story and giving them context would really help them in knowing when to use the grammatical form. Um, but there are lots of others, other, other examples like maybe phrasal verbs or prepositional phrases, for example. Those are, um, or prepositions, sorry. Those are, you know, most likely if you put it in a context and you have a story behind it, it would make it more memorable and uh, they would know, you know, how to use it better. It just reminds all of us the importance of context to everything. And no matter how much we as teachers might love breaking apart the language into isolated little chunks and fragments to analyze how each part works, that's actually not typically the most effective way for our language learners, right? Mm -hmm. And it helps um, in the world languages community as we look at teachers who sometimes have a very kind of driven curriculum pace that is driven by grammar where we're going to do all the verb tenses by the end of year two for example and yet the learners haven't internalized the the reasons for which those tenses are used in the situations um just memorizing the rules tends not to work exactly exactly and honestly with the pace model what i what really makes it you know i've given so many different examples of the pace model and I see people years later and they remember because there's one lesson that I love to give at presentations where it's actually in Arabic. Um, it's a story. It's in Arabic. And usually my audience, they're not, they don't speak in Arabic, right? So they have no idea. But through that pace model, I can get them from one word to sentences. They can say sentences by the end of one hour, a one hour presentation. They're capable of making sentences. And years later, I'll see someone and they'll remember it. They'll remember words from the pace lesson that I had given because the story and the interaction and all that just makes it so much more meaningful and memorable. So I highly recommend the pace model. I'm a huge fan and I love to use it in any situation that I possibly can. 
Absolutely. Well, and we all remember like students who can only pull out that grammatical form when it looks just like that weird disparate practice sheet or verb chart or whatever it was, which then those are the same students who end up not being able to actually use it for anything meaningful. Um, so we really want to move towards a model like this that can sets it within a linguistic and cultural context. Exactly. Um, so I actually, that actually brings us to a close. So I want to thank you, Rhonda, for sharing your expertise with us. And I hope that everyone will join us next time when we interview actful past president, Jackie Von Houten, who will guide us to deeper understanding of HLTP5, which is a great follow-up on this, by the way, because HLTP5 is focusing on cultural products, practices, and perspectives in a dialogic context. So thank you again, Rhonda. It's been a pleasure thank having you. you. Likewise, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks, and bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>